this is another webinar on behalf of the Fire Risk Management Journal. Uh, today I'm interviewing David Smith. Uh, David is a solicitor, he's a partner and head of property litigation at JMW Solicitors. Uh, David, you specialise in property litigation and I think you work for a firm of solicitors that's been voted in the Times as one of the best firms to work for. Uh, yeah, we're quite proud of that. It is one of the, the, the top uh, companies to work for full stop and one of the best uh, law firms to work for, yes. So uh, uh, we're, we, we try to keep it nice. And you're also an advisor, David, for a large organisation called the NRLA. Can you just tell us about that? Yes, I'm the legal counsel for the National Residential Landlords Association, which is, is the largest um sort of landlord organization in the country, but mostly dealing with, with small landlords of up to about 100 properties. And in total, I think the organization uh, has membership that amounts to what, quarter, half a million properties? Yeah, it's about 100,000 members and the average person owns about four to five properties. They tend to unsurprisingly have, have members who have a few a few more properties than, than just one. Otherwise, you know, why would they join? Um, so yeah, it, it's it's the sort of increasing army of of small semi professional landlords. And David, given the the nature of your job um, and the people you represent, uh, of course you do a lot of regulatory work. And amongst regulatory work, of course, uh, you deal with fire law. Yeah, so a lot of my work inevitably these days involves uh, property licensing. I've written about HMO licensing a great deal. Uh, I've written two books about it um, and a, a huge part of HMO licensing sort of links to fire safety. One of the drivers for licensing HMOs is fire safety. Um, and originally when the, the thresholds for licensing were set, they were very much linked to um, average numbers of deaths in, in properties during fires. So fire safety was quite a strong driver and, and of course, the Housing Act 2004 has 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 other safety features in it, um, as well as property licensing. It has the Housing Health and Safety Rating System, which which has since uh, the Grenfell tragedy actually become a, a huge part of of regulation of cladding in uh, in, in in residential property and in, in blocks of property as well. And and one of the ways that that we're that, that we're trying to regulate at least prior to the building safety act being introduced was through the hhsrs yeah and in fact david the case i particularly want to talk to you about has some echoes of grenfell much earlier than grenfell and on a tiny scale uh, but it yeah. draws out some of the the things that have become clear uh, during the grenfell inquiry um, i think you were representing a managing agent is that right yeah, so I was representing a, a managing agent in that case, um, and there was a landlord. They were they were separate businesses, although undoubtedly they knew each other. Um, and there was, as you've indicated, a, a fire, quite a serious fire. In in it, it was a, a small block, and I think one of the areas that's quite interesting about this in a post Grenfell world is that these smaller blocks of flats are still outside the main scope of regulation. So we're still not really dealing effectively with smaller blocks of flats. Um, but this was a smaller block with, I think, four stories and, and four flats in it, one per story. Um, a fire uh, started in the ground floor flat and the, there was issues there with hoarding. But but very quickly the fire escaped to a large extent from the ground floor flat um, um, because uh, the doors to the flats were not um, not up, certainly not up to modern standards. There was some question as to whether they needed to be improved or not. That was a, a debate that came up later. Um, and also more than fire, there was a great deal of smoke escape into the common areas and from then into further flats. That led to a great deal of panic. Um, it led to problems with people escaping. It ultimately led to people um, being evacuated through windows by fire service and in a couple of cases actually jumping from the windows, um, which led to people being injured 
uh, fortunately not overly seriously, but people did go to hospital with, with I think, a broken ankle in one case and um, smoke inhalation in a couple of cases. So in a microcosm, we see some of the problems that the Grenfell Inquiry has later uncovered in Grenfell Tower with high levels of smoke in common areas, the difficulties of evacuating through through um, smoke-filled common areas and um, the problems with um, smoke escaping into common areas from, from flats that are on fire. Uh, and thankfully, no one died, but the prosecution was saying that was a matter of luck rather than design. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the prosecution's position and, and I mean, the fire service, of course, was partly, made, uh, certainly uh, their, their anger was also increased by the fact that, that there was some risk actually to fire officers um, during during the fire and, and there was some debate as to where, as to whether this was caused by their own misuse of their equipment or not but the reality is that a, a fire ladder nearly collapsed during the evacuation which would have uh, which, which which would have eventually potentially led to serious injury of fire officers yeah. and that um, certainly motivated the fire service quite justifiably of course um, to take this matter very seriously. I just want to go through some of the issues that were encountered in the trial and how you dealt uh, with those issues now that we've got some of the background material. Uh, The first problem was, in fact, this was an old case or relatively old case compared to the distance between the time of the fire that led to the investigation to the hearing in court. It was some five years. Yeah, there was a a very long delay. Um... There were a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think the prosecuting officer had been ill, and so the fire service had had sort of sort of let it roll for a bit. Um, there was a degree of lack of cooperation from my clients. Um, so yeah, it had rolled on for quite some time. And one of the the quite intriguing aspects of this case is that is that at the time we might have been inclined to say that the delay was excessively long. Um, And in fact, that's an argument that uh, was started in court, but ended rather abruptly. Can you just tell us about that? Yes, it was one of these very odd situations um, that sometimes happens. Uh, There had been a long delay. Based on the case law as it was at the time, it was not unreasonable to argue that the delay was excessive and there was difficulty with the fair trial. But as you as you yourself will recall, we cheerfully trotted in before the senior presiding magistrate for London, as I recall, in Southwark Crown Court, who gave us a, a stern look as we started this argument. I think I think interrupted you and sat you back down and pointed out that he'd just been hearing an application for further prosecutions of a Mr. Rolf Harris, who I'm sure listeners will have heard of. If not, you can look him up on the Internet. He's quite famous um, for different things now. I hasten to add them for previously. Um, and he, he at the time was in prison. Um, the, 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 the general position was to keep him there with further revealed uh, sexual offences um, from around 30 to 40 years before. And um, at that point, having, having uh, and the presiding judge made clear that he'd already said those, those were admissible charges, as, as, as became very clear later on when Mr. Harris was indeed found guilty of those offences. Um, five years wasn't, wasn't going to cut it. Um, uh, and we were sent out with a mild flea in our ear to reconsider our position on the, on the delay argument with, with much, much apologising to the judge and general bowing of heads and my recollection, which may be apocryphal, is that the judge said something like, Mr. Mehta, do you know which case I've just been dealing with? Do you want to go out and negotiate with your opponent? Yes, it's <laughs> not a fact. And I think we had noticed, because we'd seen the monitors before we'd gone in, who it was, and we'd been and, and there'd been a lot of press outside. So we, we'd presumably been hoping for, for attendance by Mr. Harris from prison, which didn't happen. But um, we'd gone through a big press pack to get in, so we knew something was going on, and it was fairly obvious what was going on. And uh, yeah, we, we we did know, and uh, but but um, yeah, so, so... It, it's it's one of these odd situations that the law on delay effectively was quite substantially altered by those cases in a in a very practical sense, and um, and certainly in a sense that was 
made made life harder for my clients at the end of the day. So having raised and then abandoned the delay argument, um, at the next stage was negotiating a, a guilty plea. Yeah, and I think we we we'd all come to the conclusion, and and the judge had had implicitly made clear that that he didn't favour our case much. And there were a, a number of aspects that were hard to, to put a put a positive spin on. Um and and you were down to quite a complex question of, of whether you wanted to go to trial on on an issue of disputed expert evidence, um, as to whether or not the property really was unsafe. And we did have some expert evidence, but I think the thing that was particularly difficult for us is it was quite hard to argue that the fire doors and particularly the one of the areas that was problematic is the fire doors had glazing around them yes. that was not safety. Uh, it was not safe glazing. It was it was very difficult to argue under the regulatory reform fire safety order and, on, on, under which we had been served a notice yes. that um, that this property that the glazing around the fire doors was acceptable, and it was it was a fairly bleak situation in terms of of, of defending the case. Um, the uh, the fire related to 2011, so it was some years after uh, the fire safety order had come into existence. Um, but it was still an area where it, there was no clarity about the liability of managing agents. Yeah, so I don't know, there were sort of two areas of unclarity in this case. that At the time, you know, obviously wrongly, people didn't pay sufficient attention to compartmentalization. And that was certainly a, an issue that that didn't really get the kind of attention that it that it ought to ought to have done. And, and of course, is until relatively recently has continued to get a, a poor level of attention. So there was some uncertainty whether whether there was sufficient or insufficient compartmentalization and, and to what extent it was deficient. Um, but then the second major problem was the issue of, of responsible persons, which, of course, has been a, a, a big issue uh, post Grenfell for, for a number of inquiries, for the Grenfell inquiry, for the Hackett uh, report, and which the Building Safety Act, of course, is a sort to resolve. Um, we had this problem that we had a managing agent and a landlord, and we were representing the managing agent. And were they, in fact, a responsible person? For the purposes of the RFSO, I mean, uh, in in today's parlance, post Building Safety Act, yes, of course they are. Yeah. Um, prior to the Building Safety Act, that it was it was somewhat less clear as a position. Yeah, but I think in your particular case, that the contract that your clients had made it pretty clear that as managing agents, they were responsible for fire safety. Yeah, I mean, they they had they had um, substantial authority. They they had quite strict limits on spending money, but they but but subject to approval for spending, they had substantial authority and, and oversight in terms of what actually got done. Um, uh, subject to cash sign off, so so yeah, it was it was it was a, it was a slightly unusual situation there that, in terms of the management arrangement. But I think this is one of the problems that. That, that again comes out of things like the Hackett report is is that there are an incredibly large range of different management relationships which which have quite which which everyone just thinks oh managing agent and just pigeonholes it but actually that covers quite a wide range of different relationships of different levels of authority which which didn't at least uh, tie at the time tie terribly well to the idea of responsible person they tie better now but only in the sense that the building safety act has has ignored the problem and said you're just all responsible and we're not interested in in the exact nature of the relationship I, i've just finished a case david um uh, further north of london in which my clients were a managing agent and their contract with the owner landlord uh, was a half a page contract that made no mention of fire safety. Um, uh, it was an old contract. Um, the problem is that uh, through time, uh, the duties of the agent, it became clear, included fire safety. And the fire brigade were able to show specific instances when they, the fire brigade turned up 
and the managing agents turned up and appeared clearly to assume responsibility and were in a position of control relating to fire safety. So even if the contract isn't that clear, um, I suppose the way that the parties behave is important as well. Yeah, and you still see these contracts. You can see some very, very detailed uh, management agent contracts, which are, you know, 40 page specials with tons and tons of, of clarity about who does what. But it's also perfectly possible to find, a, you know, one to two pages worth of, you know, I own it, you're the agent, get on with it. Um, with with very little um, clarification about who's responsible for what, or 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 or, or, or even, and some of them are, are very bizarre in the sense that some of them give the agent lots of obligation, but they say, oh, but you can't spend any money without without our permission, and so in effect, the agent has no authority at all, really, um, uh, except to make recommendations. Accept, but but the, the agent with no authority seems to accept significant liability. Yeah, so so there's still some, and and you find them, I think, particularly in in slightly smaller blocks. And again, sort of just loosely addressing one of the problems with the Building Safety Act situation is one of the concerning elements is there are an awful lot of blocks that sit just below 18 metres and therefore fall outside the sort of stricter approach of the Building Safety Act where, where the management arrangements are pretty hazy. And, and um, I don't think that, that this is an area that the Building Safety Act and the government have really turned their minds to properly. All right. Coming back to the other point of the case, I think there were six um, counts or summonses um, and you, you were able to negotiate a, a much lesser number. Yeah, I think we, we had a fairly, a fairly robust negotiation with the, with the fire service, I recall, in the court. And uh, I think it dropped to either three or four. I think it was three in the end. Um, of the six, I think one was was obviously hopeless. The other two, the fire service were not that committed to, and, and we managed to move them off. And in some senses, they were. I, I think actually it was three for my client, and and I think the landlord was stuck for four because there was an area that we were we were able to sow some doubt as to whether we were actually responsible for, and so we ended up trimming it back to. Um, to three, to three matters in the end. And so then came to maximising mitigation uh, before sentence. And presumably yeah. one aspect of mitigation was that the agents were not uh, doing this or had not committed these offences uh, to save money. There, there was nothing in it for them. Yeah, so a significant uh, benefit from our perspective was, was the manner in which the agent was paid um, you know, they, they weren't paid on the basis of a percentage of works or, or, or for saving money. They were paid a, a flat fee effectively for operating the property. And, and so it, it was it was a legitimate argument to make that there was no profit motive from the agent's perspective um, by by skimping. There was no real particular benefit to them in skimping the thing, which was a helpful argument, I think. Um there was also, uh, as, as again you'll recall, the 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 fact that, that the agent's responsibilities were somewhat hazily specified, and there were areas in which it was possible to show that that the landlord was in part the the force that was not allowing um, improvements in fire safety to be made. So it was not it was not as simple as saying it was the agent's fault. It was a bit more subtle, and that certainly helped reduce the penalty to quite a substantial degree. This was a case that on paper might well have attracted something of the order of £500,000 in fine. Uh, and part of your job was to try to, to chip away uh, at each of the major points against your client to, to reduce that, uh, that outcome. Well, I think the odd thing about this case is if, um, if this case was heard today, um, I think five hundred thousand pounds would be the low end of, of an expectation, <clears throat> whereas at the time it was it was sort of our our mid range expectation, uh, or or our, or our sort of slightly bad day expectation, which again I think illustrates, you know how how attitudes towards uh, fire and fire safety in blocks have altered, hopefully for the better. Um, 
Um, and 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 yeah, it, it, certainly there was an aspect in which yeah, the, the whole the whole objective then was to slowly start reducing it. I mean, I, I, in truth, I think one of the things that was particularly helpful for us in the end was that the judge who who had initially uh, dealt with the matter was actually retiring, and although he passed on um, the file with notes to um, to uh, the, the judge who replaced him inevitably a lot is lost in those situations and 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 that judge to a large extent sentenced it a bit blind of the facts or, or, or with the facts you know presented in a, in a rather reduced paper format where without the the sort of the sort of hotter more emotive aspects of the case that I think the first judge had perhaps had perhaps heard and that went a long way, I think, towards reducing the penalty. So, yeah. and of course, clear, clearly, I can't say get yourself a different judge, but but sometimes it's enormously helpful. Uh, and these were the days um, when there was no sensing guideline. In fact, there, there are no, still no sensing guidelines for fire offences. Although there's case law that says the starting point is the health and safety <laughs> guidelines. But at the time, there's not even case law that suggested that was a good starting point. And that's another reason why, depending on uh, the, the judge you got, it could make a huge difference in the, the eventual outcome. Yes, and I think the, the government has suggested they are going to look at uh, sentencing guidelines for these areas. Um, uh, certainly, in, 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 they're, they're trying to look at sentencing guidelines for, for property and housing matters more generally, they've suggested in, in, in the uh, fairer renting white paper. So I, I, I would suspect this will change. Yeah. But at the time, of course, yeah, it was uh, the entry points were 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 a health and safety guideline, and and the way those entry points are structured is that they're quite oriented towards quite severe matters, usually involving severe injury or death. And if your entry point doesn't include those, you actually get a much lower entry point. And that, I think, was a was a the fact that no one had been severely injured ended up being quite a telling factor um, in terms of the entry point of severity. Um, the slightly worrying aspect of the sensing guidelines for health and safety is that um, every fire case, almost every fire case, and the harm is in fact at category 1A because it's the risk of death or serious injury. Um, and so that's at the top end of any health and safety case. Um, uh, and the odd thing is that when the sensing council was um, drafting the guidelines for health and safety, it did bear in mind whether it should include fire offences, um, uh, but said, no, we're excluding them uh, because it might unnecessarily skew the sentence for the, the, the run of the mill health and safety. Although there was nothing stopping them from having a, a separate short addendum to, to that. And uh, that's hopefully what they'll be encouraged to do in the future. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that that there's going to be a pressure to to produce a specific set of sentencing guidelines that relate to fire offences. It, I think, at this stage, it would be it would be surprising if the government didn't take that route ultimately. Um, David, in a number of my interviews, I've asked questions about experts and whether uh, an expert was used uh, in the case. Um, I think you did have an expert's report, but didn't see the need to serve it. Yeah, so the expert report we had didn't really speak to sentence. It had more to do with issues around escape routes um, from the property, which, because because we ended up not really arguing those points, weren't hugely relevant. Um, and so, so it wasn't used in the end. Um, and and in practice, I'm not I'm not sure it would ever have got us very far because. The reality is that the, the, that the glazing around the doors um, was was below any any standard that was even even at that stage was below a reasonable standard, um, and and we were always going to have a problem with that, and no expert report was going to make that situation better. And I think in your case, even though the company's turnover was very healthy, it was a small company in terms of the number of directors. And you made sure that both the directors turned up at every hearing. Was there a reason for that? Um, 
Not particularly as it happened, but it certainly helped. I mean, it, it's more that it was a small company and the nature of the directors was that they wanted to see what was going on. Um, but certainly the directors being there and showing that that this was not a trivial issue for them, I think was beneficial. I mean, just to come back to the previous point, I think what was interesting about the expert report is it, it, it was an interesting demonstration that there are times that expert evidence isn't that important. <laughs> Yeah. And, and one always tends to assume for these kind of technical things that the first thing you do is get expert evidence. But some days it just doesn't matter that much. Yeah. Um, I, I, but, a but case I think... I've recently done, both parties had experts. Uh, there was then the experts meeting inevitably uh, a few weeks before trial. And with the judge's encouragement, both parties decided we didn't need to call our experts. Um, and there were a few facts that could be admitted by both parties, and, and that was all that was required. But so and, you're and doing I that. think that one of the things that's quite interesting is, 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 is in the legal profession just now, there's a, there's, there's, because there's so many more rules around experts, experts are something that really pops straight in your head. How are we going to deal with experts? And there's an assumption right from the start you must have experts, um, particularly for something technical like this. And you know, this is one of those funny situations where it was completely irrelevant and it was it was wasted money. Um, but yeah, coming back to your your main recent point, though, yeah, I think having the directors present and demonstrating that it was a serious issue was was helpful. And 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 the landlords uh, directors all showed up as well. And I think one of the challenges of these things, particularly with larger companies is there is an unfortunate tendency by senior senior executives not to show. And um, I actually think that's often a mistake, getting a very senior executive so that so that your your counsel can turn around and say, you know, they are taking this seriously. Yeah. The the top bods are here, they're listening to what you have to say and we'll take that away. Um uh, you know, one hesitates to say that magically alters the, the number or the sentence, but I, I don't think it's a bad thing to demonstrate that this is a serious issue that you're that you're taking seriously and that you're not, you know, trivialising. And, and of course, you, other... should be, you should be taking it seriously. It's a serious issue. Exactly, exactly. But one of the other uh, points was that unlike many cases where you've got the landlord owner and the agent in the dock together, uh, figuratively speaking, because they're both companies. Um, here, we uh, were in a position where there was no cutthroat mitigation, by which I mean one party blaming the other and the other party uh, blaming back, uh, which normally creates a pool of blood and a uh, disadvantage for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I would hesitate to say they were completely on the same side. They had different representation and there were subtle differences in approach. But yeah, it, it they had a business relationship. They wanted to have a business relationship afterwards. And and my instructions were absolutely not to, to go into a place where um, where uh, there was a where there was an open warfare between the defendants. Um, that said, cooperation was limited between the landlord between between the other solicitor and, and, and us. There was definitely an element of arm's length. But what and, every advocate and, and hates... A frosty relationship, I would say. What every advocate hates is a cutthroat defence or cutthroat mitigation. Yeah, and, and obviously there are reasons to do it, but I think sometimes it can be it can be risky because you can equally have, have again, a, a judge taking the view that you're just not taking a responsibility seriously. I think... I think one of the things that's really challenging about doing fire safety defence is that you're not defending the most attractive of cases. You're frequently often actually pleading guilty and then mitigating. Um, and I think particularly today, um, you, you can be easily seen as, 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 as the worst kind of lawyer, you know, who's defending the indefensible. But... I think at the same time, obviously, it, it, it's complicated. It's a far more subtle business than most people want to appreciate. Fire safety responsibilities are still not well set out in law. Um, people, as a rule, are trying. Um, but 
there is scope for genuine error and, and you know genuine accidents do occur um so it's quite a, a difficult um role to fulfill in many cases um but approaching it pragmatically but clearly is helpful and i think it's helpful before a court as well i think david the, the culmination of uh, lots of good management and some uh, good luck uh, the sentence was actually a fraction of uh, what the clients had been led to believe yeah so i think uh, my, as i recall my client was sentenced to a, a fairly slender hundred thousand pounds which i think they actually played in they were allowed to pay in tranches as well um so and i think the landlord got a little more surprisingly at about 150,000 which in part i think <laughs> was due to the profit motive element and in part due to the fact that um for whatever reason the judge just didn't like them as much <laughs> I, I i'm not, not I, I, I partly due to the way their representation went and partly due to to the way they they conducted themselves in court for various uninteresting reasons really but i think it does say you that that sometimes slightly unusual subtle things do sway these situations that you can't ever predict david it's been fascinating talking to you thank you and thank you very much for for sharing your wisdom with us um, it, the time has just flown by and i'm just looking at the watch and it's uh, uh, almost 40 minutes and it feels like uh, 10. Um, thank you very much for taking part in this and uh, um, thank you to our, our viewers and our listeners for tuning in and also thank you for to the fire risk management journal uh, for hosting us uh, hopefully you'll tune in soon thank you very much thank you